Welcome to part 2 of our seminar, Understanding Financial Statements. In this video, we discuss accounts receivable and inventory, two very important assets that are reported on the balance sheet. Please make sure to print the PDF handout found below this video. We will be referring to the PDF handout throughout the seminar. Okay, the next line, accounts receivable, those, of course, come from having sold some merchandise or provided services on credit. So if we give somebody 30 days to pay, we have a receivable, and we call it an account receivable. And the ones that we show on the balance sheet are the ones that have not yet been paid. We use the phrase accounts receivable net because we want to subtract, and should do this, we should subtract an allowance for any doubtful accounts. So perhaps we have really 40,000 of accounts receivable but we estimate that 2,000 will not be collected. And we might make that judgment or that estimate based on uh, the fact that the customer hasn't paid in 120 days and they should have paid in 30 days. And so now we're getting a little worried or we're here on the street that this company's in trouble, right? And then maybe we got another account that's 200 days past due. So it's a good indication that maybe we're not gonna collect that. So we should put down some estimate of that and reduce that total amount down to a smaller amount. Yes? Is there a threshold that you use when you're, when you're doing the net, when you're reducing that? Mm -hmm. like, okay. Is there a threshold, a certain dollar threshold that you're looking for? Or, or is it a percentage? You know, get it 2%, we'll take off 2%, 5%. Okay. So we have a question. Uh, is there a threshold for this? Or how do we do that estimating? Yeah. Uh, right? How do, how do we make that decision? Right? Because we hope to collect it all. And so what do we do, right? So uh, my suggestion is you go through each of those past due accounts and sit down as a team and tr say, what's the feedback when we call? Are we getting uh, payment? What, what kind of message are we hearing? Uh, what, do, what else do we know? Maybe check a credit bureau. And so it's gonna be a judgment call. It's definitely an estimate. So the point that we uh, have, uh, to make here is that putting in any estimate is better than putting in nothing. So if we have 40,000 of receivables and we got some shaky ones, rather than saying, let's ignore that and list the whole 40, it's better to say, well, maybe it's 500 to 2,000, I'm not sure, and we compromise and put 1,300 in. So it's an estimate. Again, if 1,300 is better than zero if there's really some shaky accounts. One rule of thumb would be the older the receivable is, the more past due the receivable is, the bigger percentage. Right? Mm -hmm. So in academic textbooks, we'd say stuff that's current, we don't have to allow anything for that. And maybe stuff that's 30 to 60 pay days past due, maybe we'll put in 1%. And uh, then maybe if it's more than 120 days past due, maybe we'll put in 25%. But those are arbitrary uh, things for teaching and so you'll see those around, but the best thing is to review your accounts and make that communication with the customer and start getting some progress payments. If you can't even get a small progress payment, that's sending a signal too that maybe I better increase that. So, great question. Okay, the next line on the balance sheet is inventory. And that's the merchandise that we bought and plan to resell. That inventory is shown at its cost not at what it's going to sell for. And then we might actually reduce the amount to amount, an amount lower than cost. So again, inventory is at cost, but we may reduce it to an amount lower than cost. And the reason we might do that is some items might be not turning. They might be obsolete. So we uh, have a term or a, a rule called conservatism. So an underlying guideline for us is called conservatism. And that says when doubt exists, use the lower number. So if we have an item that costs us six bucks per unit and we don't know if it's gonna sell and uh, we know we can replace it for less and whatever, and we think maybe five is probably the real number today, then we should go with the five. So when we have doubt between six or five, we're supposed to take the five. Even though six was the cost, we're gonna reduce the cost to lower than cost. 
So we never go above cost for inventory. We don't put selling price down. You use cost or lower. Yes, sir. If it's supposed to be converted to cash within a year, why wouldn't it be listed at the sales price? Why would you list the cost price mm -hmm. if it's really supposed to be converted to cash pretty soon anyway? Great question. Question is, if this inventory is listed under current assets, and we just told you earlier that current assets are expected to turn to cash within one year, why don't we put the selling price down? Because that's what we're going to collect within one year. Phenomenal question. The problem we have as accountants is this cost principle. So we have this series of underlying basic principles, and one is cost. We cannot show anything at more than cost. Now, there's another one, uh, revenue recognition principle. If we showed it at the selling price, we would be actually reporting revenues, right? If we bought it for 60 and it's going to sell for 100, but we didn't sell it yet, and we put it down at 100, we'd be recognizing revenues because our balance sheet uh, has to stay in balance. So if we only pay out 60 and we mark it on here for 100, then we're going to have to put that 40 somewhere. And the 40 would have to go on the income statement, basically. So up here we have an accounting equation. So let's go fill this in for your question. If, if we bought that item for 60, one asset, namely cash, would go down by 60. And under your logical thinking, is then we should put the 100 down because that's what we're going to sell it for. But now I've got a plus 40 over here, don't I? And this equation has got to stay in balance. And I don't have any more liabilities, so it's got to go over here. And that is going to violate our revenue recognition principle. The stockholder doesn't have any more equity until they've earned it. And just buying a piece of item, uh, uh, just buying an item for inventory does not constitute earning the revenues. It really isn't earned until you sell it. Anybody can buy garbage, right? Slow moving items, you can buy all kinds of stuff. The trick is, can you sell it? The hard part is selling. Easy to stock up your warehouse, very hard to get it sold and turn it into a receivable. So this is not acceptable, right? This violates revenue recognition, violates the uh, accounting principle called co uh, cost. Okay, excellent. All right, so we were on inventory, and one other thing we should just mention for inventory is we have a, cho uh, a choice as to how we flow the costs. Now, this is important when we have inflation. If there was no inflation, we could skip right over this. But if we have perhaps 10% inflation a year in our industry, and we buy an item at the beginning of the year, and we buy another item at the end of the year, and we sell one of the items, which cost should we use? So let's say we buy the one at the beginning of the year for $10. The one at the end of the year costs 11 And we sell it for 13 So I'm in my income statement, I'm going to say I have a sale of 13 Now, what was the cost of that? Was it 10 or was it 11 Both purchases occurred in the same year. I'm doing my statement, and I have a choice which cost to use. So I'm not required to take the oldest cost first. That would be logical to say, hey, I sold the first one physically, so I'm going to take the first cost and match that $10 against the 13 and show this $3 profit. Very logical and acceptable to do that. But we also have a second option. The second option is called LIFO. You can take the last cost that came in and send that out first. And so during periods of inflation, lots of people adopt LIFO because they want to put the $11 cost on their income statement because of income tax purposes. So the entrepreneur would say, hey, if I have a choice of saying, I, I, first I sold something for 13. So if I have a choice of putting either 10 on the tax return or 11, I'm going to put 11 because then I only have tax on $2 instead of $3. So if you're trying to conserve your cash, you want to put as high of inventory cost onto your income statement and keep the old low costs on your 
balance sheet. Now, that's a lot to absorb in a couple minutes here. So again, on our free website, countycoach.com, we have a uh, topic called inventory, and we walk through the LIFO and the FIFO calculations and show you exactly what happens on each, in each uh, situation. Okay, so we're back to its cost, and then the question is which cost, and it depends. If there's no inflation, it's no big deal. But big, very astute companies conserve their cash, they don't pay taxes. And one of the requirements, though, is you must use the same method for your tax return as you do for financial statements. So if you're going to save money in your taxes, you are going to hurt your income statement that you're going to show your banker. So if you, if you don't have much profits, you're not worried about tax, then stick with FIFO, because FIFO will give you more profit. So it uh, depends. You, know, you, get, you get, probably have to get some good professional advice on this, some, somebody that knows what your tax loss carry forwards are, what the future is, et cetera. Okay? But our job to right now is to tell you that there is this choice to be made. And you can also average. So some of the software just calculates an average automatically. And so there's, uh, and you could use specific ID. Okay, and we'll get into inventory a little more when we go to the income statement because when this stuff leaves the balance sheet, the stuff meaning the inventory, when it gets over to the income statement, it's going to be an expense. So we'll visit that topic again. But again, accountingcoach.com with page after page after page of clear explanations is going to be much better for these detailed things than I can present. I appreciate the questions, so I want the questions, but it's impossible for me to try to get through that. It probably takes a week in, uh, in a college class to uh, communicate that. Okay, uh, well, we communicate it, but it's another thing to absorb it. Huh?